Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, whenever you're watching this, good evening, good night, whatever time it is when you are watching this video, I am sending my greetings to you, all right? So greetings to you. All right, so this is the May, June 2020, 2022, paper two for CSEC Social Studies. I am going to do be doing part one, which will be the four options, the four compulsory sections, I should say. Sorry for that incorrect insert. Oh, well, all right, we are going to look at the first question. So the first question says, cultural diversity is an important feature of life in the Caribbean. Define the term cultural diversity. Now, cultural diversity is the existence of societies, communities, or subcultures that differ substantially from one another. So cultural diversity is the, is the appearance of different cultural structures. And we know that culture is the way of life or the existence of different cultural practices, patterns, right, in a society. No, there are two factors that contribute to cultural diversity in the Caribbean. Two factors that contribute to cultural diversity in the Caribbean are one, our Spanish colonial history that contributed to our cultural diversity because some islands in the Caribbean are Spanish speaking islands. And that is so because they were once owned by the Spanish. Then we have our African ancestry as another contributory factor to our cultural diversity because the Caribbean is predominantly black people because black people, most or force or foreparents, that is, they were forcibly taken to the Caribbean. Next question now says the roles of family members in the Caribbean have been changing. Explain one cause and one effect of the changes in the roles of family members in the Caribbean. One cause of the changing roles um, of family members in the Caribbean is the marginalization of males. So males are no longer seen as essential figures in family, but they have been quote unquote pushed aside, right? The effect of that is we are having a lot of absentee fathers. So the males are not seen as being as important before where they were the breadwinner, the main breadwinner, the main disciplinarian, and the number one author authoritative figure in the family. No, that it's not like that anymore because females have become or are becoming more dominant and we have a lot of single single families single parent families headed by women where the men is men are non existent good next question says a government agency which is responsible for the welfare of the elderly is concerned about the treatment of the elderly in the local community suggest so three strategies that the agency can recommend to improve the care of the elderly and also explain how each strategy suggested is likely to be successful. If you have been following me for a long time, you will know that this part is very, very important for you to focus because the question is asking you for three strategies and also three justification for each of your strategy. And if you see how CXC sets the paper, you have a section for the strategy and then another section for the explanation, right? So one way in which they could improve the care of the elderly in the community is they could assign a nurse or suggest that the government or community members could together and pay and assign one nurse to every three or five elderly person that is in the community that will give each elder, elderly person individualized care. This is likely to be successful because if each elderly person is getting individualized care, then they will better be, be, better be able to function because somebody is out there looking after them because many of the elderly, they don't have anybody looking after them. And if there is somebody, they're not taking great care. But if we have these nurses and they are being paid, then they will take greater care or they will look closer on these elder, elderly people 
and ensure that they are well taken care of in terms of getting their medication, you know, just being there for them for emotional support. Good. Another factor could be engaging the elderly in recreational activities because this is likely to be successful because many times people believe that when people are old, then they are done for, they don't have a voice, they shouldn't have a social life. But having them being engaged in regional, in recreational activities, sorry, is going to lift their morale. It's going to do a lot for their emotional and psychological being. You know, it's going to uplift them spirit to know that people care and they can engage in recreational acti activities with other elderly persons too. And even young people at times. Another strategy would be the nurses that we are going to pay there will be sanctions for them if they ill-treat the elderly who are in their care. This is going to be successful because if these nurses know that if they don't take good care of these elderly people and ill-treat them in any shape or form, then there are consequences or there is a consequence that is going to force them now to take the best care of the elderly as possible. All right, if you have other strategies and justification, you can drop these in the comment section and I'll look at them and tell you if it can work or not. All right, let me move to the next question. All right, next question says, define the term group cohesion, right? Group cohesion is the extent to which group members are attracted to the group and its goals. Simple definition, you can get from a textbook or from Google. Next question says, outline one factor which can contribute to improving group cohesion in an institution. One factor that can contribute to improving group cohesion in an institution is to have inclusive leadership. We don't want a leader who is autocratic, who makes all the decisions on his own and his decisions are final and he doesn't take input from its members. For the group to be cohesive, the leader must be able to be democratic right a leader by the people for the people next question describe two functions which an institution can serve within a society all right look closely at this question it says describe two functions which an institution can serve within a society so this question is asking you to identify an institution and outline two of its functions all right so we have institutions like economic institutions political institutions, educational institutions. We have religious institutions. We have recreational institutions as well. All right, so I'm going to look now at educational institutions and outline two of the functions that it serves in our society. One of the main functions of educational institutions is, is acting as, an, as a socializing agent for society, so it socialize with its members, telling them how to function in society to be good citizens. Another function of educational institution is that educational institutions increases people's knowledge and skills and prepare them to go on to further studies or for the working world. All right, so this question now, this is this segment on government, all right? So it says, a Caribbean Elections Research Association has observed a trend of low voter turnout among voters age 18 to 35, such as three factors that may explain low voter turnout among this age group. Then you're going to outline one action that may be taken by a political party to address each of the factors suggested in CI in order to increase the participation of youth in elections. So you're going to outline the factors that you believe might cause persons within the 18 to 35 age group not to want to participate in the voting process. Then you are going to come up with a solution to get them to actually participate in the voting process. All right, so one factor that may explain the low voter turnout among the age group 18 to 35 is voter apathy. And this is a feeling by those persons in the age group that their vote won't make a difference. Many times young people believe that the, the, the political process is already rigged 
towards one political party. So them voting that won't change the outcome because at the end of the day, that specific party is going to win. How do we fix that? We have to promote that elections are free and fair, right? So they are free from political interference and the process is run by an independent body with local and international overseers of the election process. So one vote to one person and all votes are counted and they are valid. I think if this is done, then people can say that election process is fair. So persons within the 18 to 35 age group would want to participate. Good. Another factor that may cause people not to want to vote is that people are turned off from the political process. Some of them might believe that it is too tribal and there won't be much difference in, 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 in the outcome anyway, or whoever forms the government won't affect them. So they are turned off from the political process. How we can fix this is that political parties need to campaign on issues, presenting their manifesto and putting things in place for the people to hold them accountable to what they have put in the manifesto. So we need like, um, yearly reports or half of the year reports or quarterly reports to say, all right, these are things in my manifesto. These are what we have achieved and this is what to come and this is why this has not been achieved. So if the government is holding themselves accountable, right, then more persons will want to be involved in the political process to actually vote for a political party to form the government. Another reason why persons might not want to participate in the political process, um, specifically persons within the 18 to 35 age group, is that many uh, many of them may believe that the, there is not much difference between the opposition and the government. So, for example, in Jamaica, many persons are saying that the PNP and the JLP are the same thing. We would say in Jamaica, no better area, no better barrel. So, persons might be saying, Anybody that they vote for, they don't think that they will make a difference. Or of the two likely political parties, they are not seeing much difference in political ideology because many political parties are shifted away from their ideology and they merely campaign on trivial issues like road fixing, which prime minister can get the, which, sorry, which leader of the political party can wear the best shoes, have the best dub plates, things like that. Understand? Fixing this political party should try and sell the message specifically to this age group because this age group, you know, they are going to want things like jobs, housing, opportunities for higher education. And if those things are packaged and presented in a feasible way, in a way that people can believe and buy into the idea that these things are actually achievable and this political party, if they are allowed to form the next government, will actually put plans in place to achieve these goals, then persons would want to vote for that particular political party that they believe if they form the government, then these things would be achievable. All right. That should answer that question. Let's move on now to the next question. Moving on, remember to like, share, comment, and subscribe. And go over to my other YouTube channel, which is Corey Fences. Go over there, subscribe, and watch some other videos. That's my social commentary channel, right? With my traveling, my vacation, and just commentary on everyday issues. All right, let's look now at sustainable development and use of resources. So 3A says, state the difference between renewable and non-renewable resources. All right, so when we are distinguishing, when we are differentiating, when we are stating the difference, we use the word while, or we can use a statement on the other end. So renewable resources are resources that, when used, are replaced over a short period of time, while non-renewable resources are resources that when used up cannot be replaced. Simple. All right, so let's look closely at this map now. So the figure below shows a map of the Caribbean. Use the map to answer the question. So look closely at the map. All right, so first question says, place letter X in a CARICOM country in South America where lumbering is in I don't know if you can see the cursor. Look on the screen and tell me if you can see the cursor. Let me see if I can 
bring up this map some more. Where lumbering is done right here is Nicaragua, right here. And then right below here is Costa Rica. And they ask you to put a Y where bauxite is. And you can put that Y right here on Jamaica because we are a major producer of bauxite in the Caribbean. All right. So let me take out this blue. Let's move on. That was pretty easy. All right. So next question says define geothermal energy. All right. Geothermal energy is heat from the earth. These are usually reservoirs of hot water that exists or are human made at varying temperatures and depths below the Earth's surface. Good. It says now identify one CARICOM member state in the Eastern Caribbean that has good potential for geothermal energy. Right? I think it's not, I think, but <laughs> I know that Guadeloupe is the only ge geothermal energy producer in the Caribbean. Guadeloupe, all right? Next question says, explain the relationship between economic development and the use of natural resources. The extraction of natural resources are a major economic earner for Caribbean countries. And once the natural resources are identified and they are mined or extracted, then the country can make money from its exports of the the resource itself or the products that are made from the resource. And so I say, so that is money that is spent in the economy. We could explain the multiplier factor as well. And also the extraction in these industries provide employment for people, right? I will know with employment, people can improve their social life and so on. All right, next question. Such as three actions governments in the Caribbean may take to reduce the region's contribution to global warming. All right, three actions governments in the Caribbean may take to reduce the region's contribution to global warming. And then you are going to explain how each action is going to be successful. So give your action, then your justification. All right. One way in which Caribbean governments can reduce the region's contribution to global warming is cut out slash and burn as an agricultural practices because you know that smoke goes right up into the sky and damages the ozone layer, which makes it easier for the sun to penetrate the earth and make the earth becomes warmer. When the earth is warmer, we know that we have longer periods of drought and then the ice caps melt faster and cause the sea levels to rise. I will know how disastrous that can be. All right, so that is going to be successful because if we put out slash, slash and burn as an agricultural practice, then we have less emissions going up to damage the ozone layer. Another thing that can be done, another action that governments can could take, sorry, to reduce globe, the effects of global warming is to reduce the use of fossil fuel, right? using less and look to more natural energy sources like wind, geothermal energy, things that are, I should say, clean energy, right? Like solar, right? That is one as well. These things now are going to reduce the impact on the earth, right? In terms of negatives and slow down global warming. Another thing that can be done is the planting and the replanting of trees because trees are very, very important to the survival of the earth, you know, because trees are actually the lungs of the earth because we know that trees help to keep the place cooler. So we don't want the earth to become a concrete jungle. We want the trees because trees also give off oxygen and absorbs carbon dioxide. You understand? So replanting of trees is going to be successful. It's going to be more beneficial to the earth, acting as the lungs of the earth. If you have other ways in which we can reduce global warming, you can put it in the comment section as well. All right. 
So essay on regional integration only answer what they are asking. You don't need an introduction and a conclusion or a thesis statement. Those things are not needed. Just indent from the line for each part of the question that you're answering. That's what I usually inform. Like that's how I usually um, prepare my students for this segment. And regional integration, a lot of persons are afraid of it, but it's a compulsory question and it's valid all of 20 marks. So you have to study and practice past paper questions and then you are going to do well. So it says, Write an essay on the topic above, which is regional integration, challenges, and responsibilities. So first part says, state the difference between a bilateral and a multilateral agreement. So a bilateral agreement is a contract between two persons or two entities or two countries, while a multilateral agreement is a contract between multiple persons, more than two, multiple countries, multiple entities. Good. Next part says, identify two Caribbean organizations that attempted to promote regional integration before the formation of CARICOM. So the two Caribbean organizations that attempted to promote regional integration before the formation of CARICOM or are the West Indies Federation and CARIFTA. Then the next part says, outline two factors that contributed to the failure of the regional political union in 1962. That regional political union that they are referring to is the West Indies Federation. Number one thing that caused the Federation to fail was that Jamaica called for a referendum. Persons voted to say we should leave the Federation. Jamaica left and it eventually collapsed because every other country that were a part of it started to leave as well. There were a few other issues you know, that actually caused Jamaica to actually leave, there was major disagreement among territories over policies. Policies like taxation and central planning, that was a big issue, so they couldn't agree on a lot of the policy issues. But there was also a location problem because countries were having a problem with where the federation capital would be located. A lot of persons wanted it to be located in their country or their territory, and that became problematic, which also contributed to the federation failing. Then it says, suggest three actions that Caribbean governments may take to increase the movement of capital, goods, and labor within the region. One, and you're going to say why it is going to be successful. One action that Caribbean governments may take to increase the movement of capital, goods, and labor within the region are to stick to the tenets of the CSME, the Caribbean Signal Market and Economy, allows for the free movement of goods, labor within the region. So as long as countries that are a part of the CSME uphold these tenants, then we will continue to have free movement of goods, people, and labor. That's what I'm saying? No. Are you understanding what I am saying? This is going to be successful because if these tenants are upheld, then the free movement will continue. Another thing that can be done is to advertise jobs regionally and speaking specifically to labor now. If jobs are advertised regionally, then the best set of talents can come from the region and not just particular countries. This is going to be successful, you know, because not only one country in the region will be doing this, but all regional countries would agree to advertise their jobs regionally so that we can get the best talent from within the region working in particular jobs, especially jobs that are hard to fill, like engineering, mathematics, science, you know, in the field of medicine, healthcare, any kind of any jobs from those sectors. But another thing that they could do is regional countries could encourage their citizens to buy regional products instead of running to international products. We're not saying with them ban international products from being imported in and out, but we allow them, but there should be a push to, to, to support regional businesses, right? Because if regional businesses are supported, then there is a ready market in the region, so it will increase exports. When exports are being increased regionally, then regional business people can make more money and expand and even build branches in other regional territories, right? And that is going to give revenue to their government and also increase employment there as well. This is going to be successful because it's a win-win situation for governments and business people, as well as 
regular people as well, because we know that with the with people getting jobs, then them can climb up the social ladder because they'll be able to better provide for themselves and their families. All right, so this is where we have come to an end of today's lesson. When we ask a lesson like I'm at school, paper two for the June 2022-2022 for social studies, paper two for social studies. So part two will be coming shortly. Thank you. Remember to like, share, comment, and subscribe. And also go over to my other YouTube channel that is Corey Fences and go over there, watch some videos and subscribe as well. All right, thank you, ladies and gentlemen.